I remember being a 15, 16 year old kid going, how the heck is life going to work out? Where things just seem internally chaotic. The one thing I realised was all of a sudden, if I do this training, I get that outcome. I could control my body, I could control my mind. I think people go back and they see the numbers, they're like, oh wow, you rode almost 3,000 kilometres in that week and I could never do that. If you go out, you remove those boundaries and just have a go, it's amazing what you can do. You can end up riding across the country under your own steam and feeling that sense of satisfaction. You can be the most talented athlete in the world but not really be motivated to achieve certain things or you can be the other way around and you can lack the base skill but work so hard to get there and I think actually that's the more admirable trait. There's so many factors that go into it. You're always looking for this magic bullet that's gonna get you up the field and it just doesn't exist. It's literally one percenters and really your attention to that detail. I guess the first real memory that sticks out would have been my dad in the backyard when I was super, super young, like three years old. He'd be running behind me, holding my seat and saying, I'm holding the seat, I'm holding the seat. And then I'd look behind and he wasn't holding the seat. It's like, oh wow, I'm riding, I can ride. I'd be riding along thinking that he's got me. As soon as I looked behind, he'd be just standing there watching me and the amount of times that I fell off, only because I knew that dad had stopped holding the bike. I got given it, I think it was as a birthday present, and my mum was stoked and pretty excited about doing that. I went straight to the local BMX track, rolled out of the start, into the first jump, came straight off, and uh, I remember being in tears, you know, and then thinking, oh, I can't actually do this thing. <laughs> we used to ride to Williamstown from Middle Park, which at the time felt like the longest ride ever. I think it was maybe seven Ks. Gives you a whole new sense of independence and freedom. When bike riding became something we could all do, we could venture beyond the street. And we could just disappear for hours. Back then when it came to a bike, I was probably more asking for forgiveness than permission got memories going further and further up the street to get more and more speed, to jump further and further. I won lots of state titles, lots of Australian championships, won a World Cup. So I had big plans to head over to the States and race the professional circuit over there. Nine years of age, I went to the BMX World Championships. And that was partly because the community I was in got to go to all the races around sort of Gippsland. And then because we were performing well in Gippsland, we got to go to the races around state Victoria. And then we were successful at that sort of level, so then we went to national championships. If you sort of look at how you develop, I think you can have good genetics, but then you've got to be in the right environment. Mum and Dad first put me on skis just before the age of three. I joined race club when I was 12 and just loved it. Loved being outside, loved the feeling of going fast. My first races, I ended up doing quite well and getting on the podium. You know, I wouldn't stop until I'd achieved what I wanted to achieve. My first memory of my dad trying to get me into a go-kart was he bought a big cart, he chopped it in half, built a seat that I could fit in, and I drove this go-kart around and around and around in circles. I remember my first race, I finished fifth, and I made dad stay back for the podium just in case they gave trophies down to fifth place. <laughs> From there, he ended up giving up karting and just focusing his energies on my racing. There's so many sports that are cyclic. 
in terms of repeating the same patterns over and over again. And for me, I think what's appealing is there's a, a meditative state of experience with rowing, with cycling, with running. You go for an hour ride and all of a sudden you just start to slip into that state where nothing else matters and physiologically you feel like you're right close to the ceiling of what's achievable for you. But there's no comparison to others. So you're just riding off your own subjectivity but also just going with whatever the body feels like can be done. My mum had cancer, I think, for, what is it, 18 months or more, and um, she passed away when I was 11, which is one of the reasons why I stopped racing bikes as a kid. My dad made a promise that if he could do it financially, he'd send me to private school. All of a sudden, I went from being you know, a kid that had done pretty well to walking into a huge school that the numbers were massive and didn't know how to handle it. With BMX, I raced that until I was probably 21, but I had a nasty accident. Um, it was a pretty innocuous crash and uh, I broke my ankle. There was a bit of a misdiagnosis, so it turned out the damage that was done after riding on it and training on it meant I needed to get my ankle rebuilt. And that kind of put an end to the, the BMX career. Every year you're working out how you can move into the next category or next level and 2004, we got our first race at Bathurst. When I hopped into this massive V8 supercar at 16, yeah, the thing's basically driving me. I had a big crash, like a huge crash. It really knocks your confidence. You know, my mum's at the tracks asking me if I'd want to keep racing because she was so petrified of what she'd seen. The last race of the season uh, was in Grindelwald in Switzerland and I came off a jump really unbalanced twisted my knee from beneath me and my ski didn't pop off and I knew I'd done something straight away. Went to hospital and I'd blown my ACL. It was one year out from the Olympics. That had been my goal for years and to think that I've got this knee injury that I now need to rehab for 12 months was just devastating. You don't realise until you have a major accident like that and that's all kind of gone. You sort of start to think, you know, the whole riding thing, that's defining who I am as a person and that's really my source of confidence in who I am. So when that gets ripped out, you're thinking, oh, what do I do now? Ninety-three to ninety-five happened very, very quickly. Lots of ups and downs, lots of side steps and tripping over. And really could have been easy to have not got through the process. By the time I got to rowing, the underlying skills and fundamentals, even though they hadn't been developed in rowing, were there from other activities. So you go from being a school rower to being an Olympian within four years. I was studying for a PhD. An old mate from Adelaide dragged me out on a mountain bike ride and I went, oh wow, this is, this is actually quite fun. It forced me to get a bit more balance back in my life and started to get a bit healthy again. And the progression to the ultra endurance stuff was just a classic case of hanging out with the wrong people. Suddenly a certain type of behavior becomes normal. It seemed like I was trying to push things to its natural conclusion. It took a long time to get my knee right. It took 12 months. And even beyond that, to get my confidence up, took another 12 months. For me, if I've got a goal in mind, that's the focus and I'm not going to let anything stop me from achieving that. I'm hurting, but I'm not going to let my body win this battle. I'm going to be stubborn and you see people do crazy things because of that ability to flick a switch. It's when you come down to the last couple of laps and you're fatigued and tired. It's those times where you have to dig a bit deeper. With these really long events, kind of liken it to a long, slow meditation under duress. It's not like you're dealing with a sharp pain. It's more sinister. It's more of a dull ache. It's dealing with that situation where things shift from the picture in your head of how things should be to suddenly dealing with a very different scenario. But I think you really need to ask yourself at that very moment, are you doing the best that you possibly can? 
I remember vividly like struggling with anxiety and not being able to sleep and all that sort of stuff. But in the end, the idea was, if you can do that one day or one session or one stroke, we've just got to all learn how to do that consistently so that when we do 240 strokes in a race, we're there. If you've made a contract with yourself and you've agreed that you're going to finish this, the suffering finishes at the end. So you can take that easy decision at the time and, and get out, but you're going to have to live with that forever. I think you've got to have it. I think you've got to fall over. You've got to have shit happen in your life, to be quite honest. Any good performer, any business person, any artist, you've just got to have stuff. There's got to be dirt. And you've got to then learn how to pick yourself back up. My mum's influence has been a hugely driving force. I mean, I can still hear her calling out, pull your socks up. And the amount of times I've been in sporting events and I've gone, pull your socks up, you know, focus, 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 concentrate. The thing that scares me the most is not succeeding the way I want. You got pressures from the team to get a result, but no more than what I put on myself. This was hard work and I put myself through hell and I achieved something that I really wanted to achieve. You know, walking out into a stadium of 80,000 people wearing Olympic uniform and it's amazing to be a part of that and to know that you can be the best athlete that you can be. James, Mike and Nick, they were my heroes. My recollection was sitting on the start line and I'm looking across going, wow, you know, those guys are amazing. It's just another race, just another club event, just another state championships. The guys had said beforehand at the halfway mark, 1,000 metres, we were within half a length, we could win the gold. So full commitment, full energy. And we took off and we went from being half length down to being half length up. The guys said this, this is the position that if we're in, we can actually win. We can do this. 250 metres to go and looking out and every boat is directly in line. Nick, the, the race has unfolded where we just managed to get the pacing of it right. And then you cross the finish line, you wave your hands in the air and you go nuts. On the Tour Divide, rolling into the finish, you're on a very lonely road in the Chihuahua Desert. So unless you've organised it, there's no one at the finish. You finish alone and it's perfect. It is a long journey. Every day it gets me out of bed to make myself that little bit better or work on a different area that I need to improve and it's something I think about constantly. It teaches you things along the way. I've worked out the value of just turn up and give it a go. What's the worst that's going to occur? You, you fail, you don't complete it. We're far more capable than we realise. People that aren't willing to jump out of their comfort zones are missing out on so much. Just being out there and giving it a shot and not letting failure be a resistance is what people should strive for. I've heard the amount of athletes who have said I was destined to do this. Yeah, I reckon that's a really intriguing thing, I was destined to do something, why? And that's powerful beyond what the other opponent, the other end of the field or court's going to be thinking of, I'm here to, to win. Yeah, destined to do that versus I want to win, very different.